I'll say, um, you're here now, you're in Attica. We are the bosses. You do what we tell you. When we tell you to walk, you walk. When we tell you to eat, you eat. When we tell you to sleep, you sleep. When we tell you not to talk, you don't talk. And they don't look at us like human beings. Meanwhile, they are the ones that are the animals. And it functions you in a capacity as more or less like a vegetable because you're not able to think anymore because you're told what to do and when to do and how often to do it, right? I, mean, I don't think that any sane person can tolerate it. I don't care who you are. You're looking for humane treatment. That's all. Humane treatment. We are given a bath once a week. Very briefly, once a week. You see, these things, you're, you're taking away the bare necessities. Things that a man needs to feel like he's a human being. These are taken away. You don't have them. I don't know. I'm, I try not to be bitter, you see. Dealing with these people, trying to be bitter. But, I don't know, everything they do, everything they do is designed to destroy you. De dehumanize you, make you a complete nothing. So when I'm... God come in here and he tell me to do something. Now I'll do it. But now at the same time, if I feel that he's wrong and I'm right, there's nothing that they can do to me. And this includes patting that last shovel of dirt in my face. They did everything but that. You understand? That's going to change my mind. And this is what I think the attitude of most of them is in there. For now, some time, we've all been concerned about this trouble that was brewing in the prison. It's, you could feel in the air, anybody that works in a prison or institution could feel things like that in the air. You know something is brewing, we're all apprehensive, but you can't tell when it's gonna happen. Every night we expected it. I don't think nobody would intentionally try to provoke an incident because they know they realize that they don't have a chance. But at the same time, like you just can't keep presenting that garbage and accept somebody to take it. Because we had a beautiful society in the yard. You know, because basically we realized, you know, that all we had was, was each other. You know, so we clung to each other, spite of all our different ideologies, and there were a thousand ideologies out there, you know, but they worked it out for the common good. Like it was just boss, all of us together, you understand, all of us eating together, you know, like having to suffer together, you know, it was four days without bathing, you had to smell each other, four days of going hungry, sharing what you had amongst each other. It was really groovy, man, you know? Groovy in the sense that you know what it is to have unity. You did. It was really a united thing. It was a thing where, you know, where we're going to do this, you know? It was, it was nice. We, got, we might have a disagreement on it. But as to the thing as a whole, we're all together, though. There was no really racial tension, and everybody was looking out for each other, sharing food and sharing cigarettes and putting up... Uh, things to sleep in and mattresses, you know, the whole organization. And it was just fantastic the way everybody worked together, you know. It was really beautiful. And I want you brothers to get together because we together here. And we these people think we shucking and jiving, but we is for real. Well, I, I thought things were bad down home. But uh, I've never seen anything like this. The people in here are treated like dogs. Not only the black, the Puerto Rican and the white. 
And we're going to get what we demand, or we're going to die trying. Yes, sir. Thank you. Support us all the way. We're doing this for everybody. We no longer wish to be treated as statistics. We want to be treated as human beings. We are men. We are not beasts, and we do not intend to be driven or beaten as such. The entire prison populace has set forth to change forever the ruthless brutalization and disregard for the lives of the prisoners here and throughout the United States. What has happened here is but the sound before the fury of those who are oppressed. My name is Arthur Eve, New York State Assemblyman. I went to Attica when hearing that the inmates there had captured a portion of the prison. It was very interesting to see how the men in that yard had set up a city within the confines of Attica State Prison. They had set up a very elaborate uh, PA system so that all of the conversation between them and us was heard by all of the inmates in the yard. And no decisions, no decisions were made unless all of the inmates agreed. We want to apply the New York State minimum wage law to all state institutions. So we want to stop to slave labor here. We want to allow all New York State prisoners to be politically active without intimidation or reprisals. We want true religious sanctity. We want to do our own thing in this place. Number four, in all censorship of newspapers, magazines, letters, and other publications coming from the publisher. Five, allow all inmates at their own expense to communicate with anyone they please. They were asking for better educational program, better training program, drug treatment program, library. They were asking for better food, better medical care. They were asking for more than 25 cents a day in salary. Well, now, now, I was in there uh, earlier. I was one of the pool reporters who went in there. And some of the demands that they made were uh, getting out of the country, etc. Um, how, how would you characterize these? Are these realistic demands? They have a list of uh, what they call practical demands, which are 15 demands. Just about every one of them have to do with the improvement of prison conditions. This is not a riot of prisoners who are seeking to escape. It is a riot of prisoners who are eminently practical and who are spelling out conditions which they feel should be improved and many of those conditions are requirements which are now in the existing law the incident did not happen because uh, you know the inmates were trying to stage dramatics they you know the incidents arose uh, because of some you know legitimate uh, uh, shall we say grievance that they had and uh, I think that uh, uh, how much headway uh, the you know that comes of that will be uh, just how uh, you know honest and frank you know the authorities can face up to the situation they have
first, second, and third follow right along here. The New York State Police deployed to Attica 30 high-powered rifles and 232 riot guns. The State Police riot gun is a 12-gauge shotgun with a 20-inch barrel and a full choke. There were also members of the State Park Police present as well as members from 11 sheriff's departments. There were also weapons from the arsenals of the Attica prison itself and weapons brought from Auburn by corrections officers who came from Auburn. These weapons included 22 high-powered Winchester rifles, at least a dozen 32 caliber pistols, and two weapons that are capable of automatic fire, the Colt model AR-15 and the Thompson submachine gun. The decision that had to be made quickly when I arrived was, would I talk with them or uh, was there sufficient support to move in and retake the institution? Now, the tradition in this area is not to negotiate, am I correct? That's right. And you made a decision uh, that you would not only negotiate, but that you would actually go into the stronghold of the inmates uh, and negotiate there. Yes. I got a feeling that there might very well be uh, enough people in that yard who would believe in me that um, uh, we might be able to do some meaningful negotiating. He started out being sincere, you know, and all of a sudden he deviated. You know, he came out of a brand new bag. You know, and I figure, like I said, that uh, uh, Dunbar and Mancusi, people like this here, and uh, Rockefeller put pressure on him. You know, that he started playing the word game. I myself, as an individual, had a lot of respect for Oswald. Especially for the fact that uh, a man of his position, you know, uh, coming into a yard full of uh, rebellious inmates, it takes a lot of guts. And uh, I admired him for that, but... Uh, he threw that down the drain because uh, he came in and told the inmates something, you know, one thing, and uh, he wasn't aware of the fact that we had television sets and radios and we were watching what was going on outside that gate. And as soon as he walked out of the yard and walked out the front gate, there uh, was a newsman to, uh, that interviewed him there, and uh, he asked Mr. Oswald, uh, what do the inmates want and everything, and he changed it all around. He says, oh, they want the world, you know, he, he was very negative and Naturally, the inmates didn't want him anymore. They couldn't, uh, they figured they didn't, they couldn't trust him. He wasn't a man of his word. They trusted him the first day, you know, but everybody dug the change up in his manner. Mr. Wicker, how did you happen to go to Attica during September? My name had been included on a list of names that prisoners who were then in revolted Attica had asked to come, um, to come and observe the proceedings there. And when did you arrive at the Attica prison? Uh, late in the afternoon of Friday, September the 10th. Uh, I would suppose in retrospect it was about 4.30 in the afternoon. Well, Dad, my further testimony to the unity that's shown in the yard, to the unanimous testimony of these men that they regard themselves as being aggrieved by the treatment that they say that they have received in the prison in past years, and they appear to be unwilling to give up the hostages, give up their situation in the prison for anything short of a, of a uh, complete amnesty. Now you had a situation in which the state was saying no uh, amnesty and the inmates said that they wanted total amnesty. What did you do about trying to prevent this confrontation that was uh, looming up? By, by midday Sunday, I think what most of us felt was that the attack was quite imminent. And it was coming because we had this deadlock. We weren't able to work out anything on amnesty and so forth. Hence, about the only thing we could do, we thought, was to, uh, to try to uh, maintain the status quo by time, stall off the attack, and hope that somewhere along the line, either the prisoners or the state would yield in such a way that, uh, that, uh, that an agreement might yet be worked out. In other words, if we could just, we felt that the hostages were not going to be harmed, 
You know, many of the people out there wanted to uh, take out their old grievances on the hostages, which is understandable. There were many hostages there that I had had previous grievances with. But these things became obsolete in my mind at that stage, because something much higher, you know, was at stake. Uh, the hostages are, by their own testimony, are sleeping on mattresses, and the prisoners in most cases are on the ground. Hostages are getting what food there is. Hostages are getting medical care treatment. They all requested strongly that as much consideration as possible be given to granting uh, full amnesty to the prisoners. Treated all right? Yes, I have so far. I've been treated very good. No, no complaints, but uh, no. no problems so far? So far. Been treated very good. The inmates here, the human beings here, have gone out of their way to see that we get what medical attention they can provide for us. They've seen that the serious injuries have been taken care of in the hospital. They've taken care of our food needs. And they've gone to the all extremes of the farthest extremes that they could to see that we were kept comfortable. Uh, did you so, the, so the emphasis was much more nearly on preventing the attack by Sunday than it was on literally working out an agreement. And is it fair to say that the emphasis was not on leaning on the inmates to accept what had been offered, but more on trying to get the governor or somebody else to give you the time? That's right, because the inmates had no power to carry out an attack. You did make a telephone call to the governor that day, am I correct? Yes. Uh, we got him on the telephone at, uh, at uh, Tarrytown. I spoke to him first. Uh, I described the situation to him as best, I, as best I could. And our apprehensions that the attack was going to be made and made very shortly. And our hope that, that, would, that, that he would uh, prevent that. And that he would uh, then come to Attica. Uh, as at the invitation of the observers group, we made it very clear to him that we were not suggesting that he come up there pursuant to any demand by the prisoners, nor were we demanding that he come up and talk to the prisoners, nor meet with the prisoners in any way. We were, we were suggesting that he come to Attica at our suggestion to meet with us. Now we felt, and this was the agreement of all in the committee. It was my feeling, it was Senator Dunn's feeling, it was Tom Wicker's feelings, as well as Mr. Kenyatta, the young lords, and the whole group, from all the way from the extreme left to the right. We all felt that it was important for Governor Rockefeller to be there. Uh, it would seem that um, uh, it might be appropriate for someone as warm and understanding as Governor Rockefeller to walk that last mile and, and come. Uh, it, would be a, it would be a suggestion to the, to the prisoners themselves, uh, at least um, a symbolic gesture to them, that the governor was concerned over what was happening, that he uh, had some concern for their welfare and their fate and their safety, as well as the, the, those of the hostages, and that, that uh, his actual physical presence at Attica would, would signify that to the prisoners. I, that was the first thing that I thought would happen. And secondly, that if he would pre prevent the attack and come up to Attica and take personal charge that way, uh, we could then just maintain the status quo for one, two, three days, who knew how long, and at the end of, those, uh, at the end of that time or at some point, uh, while the question of amnesty and other points might not have been negotiable on Sunday, it might have been negotiable by Wednesday. It might, all kinds of developments might have taken place that would have made a settlement possible. Now, it is not true that we felt that the negotiations were fruitless and were coming to an end. It just isn't true, no matter what some of the committee members may say now. At that point, that was not the case. Every single one of the members of the Observer Committee at that point felt that there was value in additional negotiations. There was no evidence in these negotiations that there was a real desire to settle because all of these 28 offers had been made and the position had hardened, not softened. So I then said, no, I would not come. I didn't think a useful purpose would be served. We called in Commissioner Oswald, and we all pleaded with him to give us an additional day. We asked him to give us through yesterday at midnight. He turned that down, too. I also thought that we had a chance to hold it off. 
and if we still had their confidence. That's why we spent five hours, more or less, from the time we got out after supper on Sunday night with Oswald till about midnight. Because I really believed, in one sense, that they wouldn't sacrifice the hostages. I just hope that the commissioner and the other people in the committee that they've gathered together can up, come up with a solution to solve these people's problems and ours. Thank you very much. I had, of course, asked to uh, get out on television and, and perhaps talk. So I talked about the good treatment that we had got and uh, the medical help and the care. And, and, of course, we hadn't been harmed up until then. And uh, they said then at that time, do you want to talk to uh, Governor Rockefeller? I said I'd be very happy to. I don't just remember all my speech. It was off the cuff. Uh, what you said was, you Governor, we are here in the yard with quite a group of people, and everything that you can do, I am highly in support of. We lived for four days under the same conditions they are living in, and we are 38 men who understand exactly what they are trying to get for themselves. Now, it would seem a shame to waste a group of educated people like this. And then there was applause. So here we are, and we are waiting for your reply. That sound familiar? That's just about it, as I remember it. But uh, one thing I especially remember, the inmates all uh, clapped and shouted uh, after. So I think they were thinking along the same lines I, I was thinking. Which was what? Which was that uh, the waste of people out there. I mean, <clears throat> here was 38 of us, and, <coughs> and perhaps... Uh, we were going to die. Uh, Sergeant Cunningham, now would you give us a message for Governor Nelson Rockefeller? I certainly would. One of the recommendations is, and if he says no, I'm dead. these people are the retaking of this institution. This institution is not important. It's lives that we're interested in here. What's more important? Let the people in the world, let us know what you feel about this. We want to hear from you. We want some, some support from you all. But if we cannot live as people, then we will at least try to die like men. <laughs> Nobody takes a weapon from you. You're to meet force with force. There have been uh, some of the prison personnel severely injured here this morning, and we certainly don't want to see any of our people hurt. any longer would not only jeopardize innocent lives but would threaten the security of the entire correctional system 
of this state. Armed rebellion of the type we have faced threatens the destruction of our free society. We cannot permit that destruction to happen. At that point, the decision was made, there was no alternative but to go in. I supported that decision, and as Chief Executive Officer, I'm responsible for what happened to this day. screaming and like at first they thought that they were shooting rubber bullets and all these people started getting up and you'd see them getting blown apart. The helicopter flew over and they told everybody to surrender. Guys put their hands on their heads and uh, when they, they said it's the second time, they just opened up shooting. I got my leg shot off. The state trooper walks over to me and says, uh, you won't rebel no more, will you nigga? And hit me in the leg with the gun butt. Uh, the one that was shot on. So the guy says, well, let's kill him. So the other guy says, um, no, uh, we're not going to kill him. He's going to bleed to death. The guys that got their shot in the head, some guys got their head, pieces of their head shot off in the chest, you know. On the whole, man, this guy's just laying all over, man. It's like a battlefield. Guys were just laying all over, man. They were like, um, they were shot all up, man, you know. And they was trying to give up there, some of them. And uh, they were just shot down, just like that. I seen a bunch of people that's supposed to be human beings just shoot like they shooting wild animals in a jungle. Cold-blooded surrender with his hand on his head, but he still be exposed to being killed. I heard a guy holler out, you know, like, please don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. And the guy told him to shut up. So he said, don't kill me. And they kept repeating. He said, I said, shut the fuck up. So the guy kept saying it, and then I heard a shot ring out, and I didn't hear this guy no more. You know, no tears in my heart. I, my, my heart bleeds for all those brothers, man, you know? But I've seen it, man. I've been through the fire. I've seen it. Our objective was to reach them as rapidly as possible and protect them. But was there anything in your plan that would have protected the hostages in the uh, circle in the yard, which is where they were on Sunday, if the inmates there were determined to cut their throats. In the event that we didn't reach them in time? Well, you, you couldn't have reached them in no, five or ten at. seconds that it would take to slit a throat. No, that's what I'm getting at. In other words, I, I just want to clarify your yes, question. Sure. Uh, are you asking were there any plans to do anything about the hostages if we were not able to affect our mission and surround no, them? No, what I'm asking really is whether there was any way that your plan could have saved lives of the hostages if the inmates were determined to cut their throats. Oh, I doubt it. Dunbar stated, Dunbar stated that the reason that Oswald gave the orders to come in and shoot and killing people was because he personally saw an officer having his throat cut. He says he watched his officer have his throat cut, he says, and he was really, really terrified by this, you know. And he said he also saw, in the process, an officer being emasculated. This was what the incentive for coming in and killing everybody. Now, all what the days all? before the assault and during the day of the assault, we as responsible newsmen depended on the word of the commissioner of the State Department mm -hmm. of Corrections. Mm -hmm. He came out here repeatedly at the height of the most dramatic moment that has ever happened in the state of New York mm -hmm. and repeatedly gave us what we were led to understand was factual information, mm -hmm. information we now question front to back. What we ask him to give us the courtesy of responding to those, those questions. Give us some answers. To well, do, short of that, he's well, frightened and scared. What information did he give you that was inaccurate? He told us How about people slashing throats. And I want to especially criticize the news media, which accepted as true, without any reservation, without using the word alleged, the statements of the prison authorities and the governor that the men, the hostages, had had their throat cuts, that one had been emasculated, and that two had been killed long before 
the onslaught by the state troopers. You did everyone a disservice in accepting that fact. You did everyone a disservice and might have caused additional tragedy in reporting as fact what now has proved to be lies. And I think in the future, you should judge your own consciences in how you report statements of public officials without any opportunity of the outside world to verify them. The press was eager to get out of the story. More eager to get out of the story than to investigate the story they were getting out. They wanted to say, well, we'll get the scoop here. We'll get it to the readers quick. But they weren't concerned with the authenticity of it. What, what hostages was killed by his throat being cut? Name one. None. All of them was killed by bullets, gun wounds, shotguns, M16s, and whatnot. So now after they recognized that they bullets had killed the people, now what they going to do? They're going to dupe the people and tell the people that their throat was cut. That's the reason they told the lies. They had to justify their wrongdoing. Okay, but, uh... Seven. She said seven out of nine, is what you said. Uh, I just, the impression, I'm sorry. The impression I'm not, we all heard it. About it. I think if you go back right. over your tape, you'll find out right. I said several. several I've been, I understand. But the point seven. is, there were none. The forensic pathologist who did the examinations reported that the cause of death in each instance was gunshot wound. And even after they found it was wrong, they didn't put in their papers that Okay, did we find we were wrong? They didn't do that. They just didn't speak about it at all. Like, okay, so we made it. But however, if it was proven, and it has been proven, and they were wrong, they should have reprinted uh, an apology. You know, to their readers. They told them a lot, you know? Not only that, I would go one step further. They should print an apology to us. Okay, how can you apologize to a dead man? commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If Rockefeller had taken your father's advice, what, what do you think would be the situation today? Well, I think that most likely my father would be alive right now. And that was more or less uh, the big wheels fault for sending, giving the state troopers to order to attack him. Uh, did you have any communication with the governor uh, prior uh, to uh, September 13? Prior to? Yes. No, sir. And uh, when you asked prior to, did you have a communication afterward? Yes, sir. What was that communication? Telephone. And what was the nature of the conversation? He spoke to me. And when he spoke to you, he spoke to you and thanked you? Yes, sir. I, uh... I imagine that they would have come in, you know, with the uh, nightsticks and so forth. They would have taken over the prison and retaken the prison. But I never expected them to start shooting like that. Uh, and then they had a, a PA system saying, um, place your hands on your head and surrender to the nearest officer and you won't be harmed. And they kept shooting people when they said that. They said they shot people, right? It was a slaughter line, man. It was uh, people were, were defenseless, all right? They, they had sticks and uh, homemade weapons to defend themselves, but this doesn't compare, man, with, with magnums and carbines. Well, this is ridiculous. They call it indiscriminate firing. I call it plain, outright, premeditated murder. We're on the roof of C Block, looking at a detail of 270 marksmen with instructions to clear the catwalks upon command. Six. six. And the bullet would be thrown forward, which would be arming the, the weapon, so to speak. One round in the chamber. <coughs> to fire the weapon, it would be brought up, sighted through, squeezed uh -huh. up around. The, and would that be approximately the speed at which a uh, qualified 270 man can uh, uh, fire, Mr. Little? Yeah. Well, were you were you qualified as a 270 man? Yes, I was. Yes, okay. I was. And, uh, 
Uh, depending on what you'd be shooting at a stationary or a moving target and whether you were resting or whether you were firing off hand. But uh, uh, that's the speed that I would probably fire the weapon if I were hunting. And what was the position in which people were firing this? Were they kneeling? <clears throat> yes, they were kneeling over a parapet uh, in this fashion, looking down into the yard. I was laying perfectly still, uh, more or less like playing possum, and these uh, bullet slugs kept exploding right near my head, but I didn't dare move. And I noticed every time one would hit the ground in front of me with mushrooms, so I knew they were shooting these hollow nose bullets. And I didn't know at the time what caliber or anything, but I know it's, uh, it was what people most, uh, what's uh, popularly known as dum-dums. Well, uh, I was hitting my left side with what they call dum-dums, you know. And I passed out in the cell, you know, from loss of blood, internal bleeding. And, uh, they took all kind of x-rays and said they couldn't remove the bullet, you know. It was too close to vital spots and, uh, you know, due to the type of bullet, I guess, you know. You know, I'm constantly in pain. I guess I have to live in the rest of my life, you know, that's what they're telling me, you know. As you can see, the projectile, as it leaves the weapon upon impact, begins to, and it is designed to expand inside the body of the game animal, the target animal. Pursuant to the Geneva conferences and respective of the sentiments expressed therein, to prevent, insofar as is possible in war, unnecessary human suffering, the United States military personnel are prohibited from use of this kind of weapon, ammunition in combat. And uh, after we were taking the hay block there, we were there for our guys, was, we were required to run the gauntlet, you know. They got officers on both sides, you know. And uh, we were required to run that where they had the belts and the buckles and everything out there was like whamming them, you know. A lot of guys got broken limbs on account of that. I saw lines of uniformed correction officers on either side of the corridor swinging their clubs and uh, striking the males who were running through there. So I was, in, I was in charge of the litter team. So I just picked the first door as we got into the reception center. And as I walked in, I got the door a quarter of a way or halfway open. And I saw correction officers bending over, beating on somebody that was on the floor. And they told me to shut the door that I wasn't allowed into that room. Did you receive any reports that day of any acts of mistreatment of inmates? No, sir, I did not. But basically, they were in the position of having surrendered hands on head, were coming down and were very forceful be forcefully being forced down the steps, uh, were forced to lie down and low crawl across there. Apparently, the method employed to get them to lie down was to hit them with a club across the knees, or in several instances, uh, not two disguised attempts to hit them in the genitalia was made. Injury was done to uh, prisoners at that point by the violence with which they were forced to lie on the ground and crawl across. The most frightening part about the whole thing was when they'd moved everybody into A block yard like, and had us on our faces laying down and it, like I was trying to look up and look around at what they were doing and a, a policeman came over and he put the shotgun barrel right against my head and told me to bury my nose in the mud and he kept the gun barrel against my head for about a good five minutes just stood right there with the gun barrel pressed into my skull you know I was I was crying then because I was really afraid that they were going to pull the, the dude was going to pull the trigger because I'd seen him shoot a couple other people there had accumulated a group of uh, persons just at the door leading from D to A. These were people who had not been there previously. They were ones who had uh, bullet wounds or in one instance a fractured leg. Uh, this man I saw get his fractured leg. He was coming down the steps and was hit across his uh, tibial area which is the forefront of his leg. Who, uh, when you say you saw him hit, hit by what kind of personnel? They were primarily the, high, the uh, prison guards themselves. Were they calling them names? Or yes, What they were they were. saying? Uh, I hesitate to use uh, 
a such language in a, well, in I a, think we've we've had this in, language in a, in a here if you can uh, a company there were racial epithets uh, the uh, classic anglo-saxonism of f-u-c-k was used in multiple uh, times the basic tenor of the thing was you sons of bitches had your week last week this week is going to be our week I would comment on it as a professional under a situation like that, uh, it was most appropriate to have them on the ground and crawling along. It, it, it had, is true that it had rained uh, that night or the day before and the ground and spots were muddy. That's part of, uh, that's the, the situation at the time. To strip them, to assure that there was no weapons on their persons is appropriate or in their clothing or that they had no injuries on their body is appropriate too. And I would say, uh, uh, a routine and standard practice in terms of situation like this. They stripped us of everything we wore. They took our watches and uh, most uh, ground them into the ground. The same thing with the eyeglasses and the uh, false teeth and everything. They took it away from us and they ground them into the ground. And they smashed all my glasses, my wish, my, my wristwatch. They just smashed them, you know, with storm troopers, state troopers, um, boots. They smashed everything. I was taken out of the yard, and I was put on a table, nude, laying on the table with my head looking up at the catwalk being spit on, hot shells thrown on my body, cigarettes thrown on my testicles. They had a football under my throat. I am looking up at a shotgun, and if it fall from under my chin, I would be killed. My body, at present, have cigar burns, cigarette burns, all over it. My testicles at times bother me now from cigarette butts, sticks, rifles. Uh, did you see any inmates uh, lying in that yard with shotgun shells on them? Yes, sir, I did. Now, did you ask anybody for an explanation of why they were being held like that? Yes, sir. I was informed that they were uh, uh, some of the identified ringleaders and uh, what I would describe as the unusualness of the situation with the shotgun shell on his breast or on his, as his knees were up like this, lying on his back, uh, so that he, uh, sure, he didn't move. Did you consider that to be an appropriate way of restraining a person? The alternative, I suppose, would have been to handcuff them. I don't know that they had them there. Uh, it's an unusual way. I believe a lot of inmates were killed after the takeover proper. There was a lot of sporadic shooting uh, late to the night afterwards. And a lot of inmates were pulled out of their cells at night, late at night. And uh, we'll draw your own conclusions. They come uh, around later looking for the guys, you know. You know, they say, oh, you Frank Lock, come on out, you know. He said, we got our orders to remove you. I said, remove me where, man? You know, he said, no, man, come on. So he, he's with other two state troopers, you know, walking with the gun like that. So then they took me to the D block over there where the ditches had been dug by some of the enemy. They took me over by the ditches, and they asked me, was I going to beg for my life? You understand? So I, I refused to say something, say anything, because I would resign if he was going to shoot me. He's a guy here with a gun like this, a 38 stub nose like this, and another guy with a rifle and all this. And, um, I thought they, they was going to, you know, like, kill me, you know. So I didn't say anything. So just a few seconds or so, a guy hauled out to the breaking window, correction officer. I'll never forget his face as long as I live. He told him to bring him back. You know, he's not the one bringing him. So they brought me back, you understand? Cold-blooded, premeditated murder. This is not a farce. I am telling you what I seen with my own eyes. I speak of my dead brother. L.D. Buckley, I know for a fact that he was premeditatedly murdered. I know this. I saw four men on the ground, fully clothed, with their heads to the ground. And I told Bobby Garcia, there's L.D. Barkley, the young man from Rochester. And I asked whether or not they were dead, and he said, no, they were alive. And I to the best of my ability, and I've stated this in federal court, recognized one of them as being L.D. Barkley. Brother L.D., I know they, they murdered him. 
because I seen him when it was had us in a block area of searching us, you know. I seen him and I testified to that effect too. And the thing about it, after I testified and I came down to see my attorney right after that on the other side down the hall a little bit, um, the officer wanted me to write Judge Curtin and told him that I made a mistake in my testimony in regard to seeing this fella, this brother LD that they killed. And I immediately told him what to, what to kiss, you know, and things like that. And I did say in my notes, and I want to repeat it here, sir, because it is my firm belief, from my knowledge of the plan and what I could observe of it, uh, there was excellent self-discipline, excellent self-control, excellent response to uh, commands, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, while we were all concerned about the number of casualties that would occur, uh, and while uh, there were some, if, if you look at it as I do and try to report it to you, that only, uh, and I believe 24 initially died, I'm going by memory now, and... 39. Th initially, sir, there were some that wounded that died later is the point I'm trying to make, but that's maybe beside well, the I point. I don't know whether there's, you draw a distinction between whether the wound is so mortal that you die that Moment, All right, I'll, ex I, I'll accept hours, that, but uh, in view of the, uh, the situation, I'm only trying to say the number of casualties reflect to me quite honestly that there was this excellent self-discipline and self-control and good mm -hmm. plan. But I would regard your position as the state official as being one to uphold the law. These men were entitled, whatever they did, to due process. And, they had, and I would think that it, it is, to me, inappropriate for you to come before us and, and seek to justify that in the way you have. Mr. Carter, I uh, certainly respect uh, your uh, right to an opinion and the like. I can only respond uh, by uh, asking you to examine the record uh, of a young man that grew up in a cosmopolitan neighborhood uh, that was student body president that played football with every ethnic group that I have been without prejudice, that I uh, was commended in California for developing a, a comprehensive program for the recruitment and development of minority groups in correctional work, and I've always struggled for fairness and democracy and uh, equal opportunity. And I stand on that record, sir. Well, I stand on what I've said. Thank you. The only way that they think it's possible to satisfy the people is come with a mask of indictments. That way, they think that the people's just gonna get their mind off of what is really going on. The state has poured in hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, Governor Rockefeller decided to divert um, all of the resources of the uh, newly created Organized Crime Task Force. This was a uh, special uh, section of the Attorney General's office that had been just set up in 1971, supposedly to finally in a comprehensive way attack organized crime in New York State. Instead, uh, because of Governor Rockefeller's need to vindicate what he did at Attica, he diverted that entire task force under Mr. Fisher um, to investigate the Attica situation. There are no blacks on the grand jury. Uh, there are no young people on the grand jury, really. You know, young people can vote now, like 18. I don't think there's anyone on the grand jury 21 years old. And the income is very high. It's like from $10,000 on up. Some people own a whole business, you know, like a bus service, and that's, you know, pretty big money. So uh, we don't have any fears there, really.
all inmates thus far that has been indicted. And it was them that murdered 40, you know, people in that yard, even their own employees. They came in and they showed who the criminals were. We got brothers going in the courtroom with legs on, with arms on, and got bullets all in them. What did we do? We only stood up and asked to be treated as a man. They had to bring it back. They murdered us there. And they had to have some reason to tell the world why they murdered us. Now, the conditions that were in Attica, they created. We didn't create the conditions, you see. We came there and we were caught up in them. And we spoke against them. And so because of that, they have these indictments against us. On the Attica Correctional Facilities, this is a, I was just handed up by one of our counsel, a report that we received there that indicates that 89% had adult criminal records, which indicates that the system did nothing for them, that whatever happened during the process of their incarceration, they came out into the street and went right back in. The penitentiary, you know, like, it affects everybody because if the penitentiary is used to reform, right? A person goes to jail, if he's not reformed, he's gonna rip you off, man, you know? Like, assuming that, like, I am an animal, right, when I go in. If I'm not dealt with, when I come out, I'm gonna rip you off, man. So you're gonna pay twice. You're gonna pay through your taxes, then you're gonna pay again if I stick you up. Now, you, you've been a, uh, in, the in the correction institution system since 1937, have you not, uh, Mr. Yes, McCusin? sir, I have. Would you say that recidivism was on the rise during the period of time that you've been familiar with uh, our correction institutions in the state of New York? I've seen statistics to that uh, effect. Uh, may I submit to you, Mr. Brasco, uh, that uh, this uh, problem of corrections is a very complex problem. Oh, I understand uh, that. But I think that I can safely say that 89% at Attica, having prior criminal records, is a clear indictment of our system's failure to rehabilitate. You know, like it's a multi-million dollar enterprise or industry, and it's the only industry that, you know, uh, functions off of failures. The most standard, the most basic wage in, in the metal shop in Attica is like 25 cents a day. Now, for what is produced and manufactured in that metal shop, You'd be surprised at the money that be made in Attica, behind the sweat, behind the slave labor of the men that's working in 105, 110 degree in that metal shop. They they need the manpower to run this industry. They need the uh, the uh, personnel to run these industries. And what what is rehabilitation? I don't think such a thing exists. The town of Attica thrives off of you know the people inside the penitentiary. You see, if it wasn't for, you know, the institution, the people would have no jobs. You have the mayor of the town works inside the joint, right? You have, uh, 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 it's, it's like what you call um, neopotism, I think, was when you have, you know, your brother, your cousin, your uncle. Everyone works inside the joint. On the day of the riot, there were 398 correctional personnel assigned to Attica. In talking to them, we found that their major motivation in taking a job at the Department of Corrections was not to do correctional work, but because it was a good job. It's a secure job. It has good pay for a rural area. It has retirement benefits. And at least in the past, up until about the middle 50s, it paid a good deal more than civilian employment in the area, than farming, or than other state civil service or law enforcement jobs. Here I am dedicating myself to these people. But you spend your life working with them. Yes, sir. You think you, uh, I'm proud of the work I do. Let me, let me tell them this. This is what's got us upset. This department, department of Corrections seems to be going downhill. It's everything to make it easier for these inmates, and the easier you treat these people, the harder it is for us. But just you say you're trying to rehabilitate them. That's right. Do you know what their mentality is? Very low. Like, you, you have a few people, you know, a few guards that they try to relate. But there's, like I said, there's this, this little inner circle where if you have a young guard who might come in and he might try to relate to, uh, you know, me or someone else, he is, you know, more or less uh, castrized, you know, or 
You know, he's, he's really harassed by his, own, by his own fellow gods because they don't want him to treat me as a human being or a man because this would be an acknowledging that I'm, you know, that I'm a human being. And so they don't want any of the gods to do this. And if they continue to do it, they'll put them on the wall. By the wall, I mean that they'll put them on the tower or they'll put them on the night shift when there's no one that he can relate to around. And this is what happens to the gods. And most of the gods are like from a rural background, you know, white, you know, and like they really can't relate. I mean, there's no communication. Due to the fact that approximately 75% of the institutions in this New York state are black, they don't have the right, proper facilities to deal with them. They need more black teachers, black instructors, black correction officers, black ministers, black priests, and they need black councilmen. You know, I'm talking about guidance people. So we understand the problem. And then it is the Civil Services Commission's fault that you only have one black guard at Attica? Or not even one uh, black guard, I wouldn't one black employee? I wouldn't ascribe fault. Uh, well, is it the uh, Civil I would say Service? that this is, this is a fact. For the past 50, 60 years, they just assume that they know the problems of a black person from the ghetto, and they don't know it. They come from New York. They're just plain people to us. But they come from Color New York. Means nothing. But they come from New York City from a different kind of world. They come from all guard, New York State. Right, but most of them come from a lot from New York City. And uh, many guards come from upstate farmland, and they're just from two different worlds. Is that a problem? No, it isn't. Because we seem to mingle and get along pretty good. I just you say again. Well, what they do is they go into your cell. They will destroy your literature. You might write some, you know, essays. They'll go in there, take your bed, turn it upside down, and just, you know, more or less make your little uh, li living conditions which you have just as horrible as they can. I understand the reasons that it takes, you know, so many people to control that many people. But by time morning comes and you own that cell, there's no other way a man can feel but bitter and full of hate, and he has to be a superb intellect beyond all intellect, Buddha, to remember that the people who are keeping him here are human beings, because it is that bad. Now, what is your professional uh, feeling about pris prisoners being allowed to send out uncensored mail? If censorship is taken away, I feel that the prisoner will be the loser. Every time you get a letter, it's open. It's censored. If they think you are supposed to get it, they'll cut it like quite a few of my letters I get. They'll be all cut up. If they don't cut the stuff out of the letter, they'll erase it. Through censorship, many things which accrue to the uh, prisoner's value are found out. You know, so they are censored. You know, so often, that each officer knows your personal business. You know, officer, you're going to be in the yard tomorrow, you might have words with him. All right, so you don't get no mail for three or four days because he's angry. How can he get back at you? Easily, to hold your mail back. I don't think that anyone who has never been near a jail, I mean, the average person, will believe what a jail is. There is no way on earth you can really convince the average, especially middle-class person, as to what a jail is like. It's a lot worse than anybody thinks it is. You see, when a man serves you your food, he takes your food and gives it to you like he's serving an animal. How do you feel? How would you feel? There's no way in the world that I could possibly describe to you exactly what his food is like. No more than tell you it's not even fit for a dog to eat. The main diet is starch, starch, potatoes and bread. The soup is basically very hot water. If they say chicken soup, you won't find a piece of chicken in it. Well, the only thing you find in the soup, if they say bean soup, you'll definitely find some bean. Otherwise, you don't find anything. The soup is just hot water. What was the per capita cost? 62 cents a day now, at that time. I'm told that that's, that was a figure that produced a diet below the uh, level of the welfare department. Did you consider it to be adequate? I can only say that in a department that Attica for years uh, had the reputation of being one of the best feeding uh, institutions. But that's speaking comparatively. What about uh, looking at it more objectively? Did you consider feeding people on 62 cents a day to be adequate? Uh, 
It could have been much more adequate with more, I will say that. Some people have ulcers or, you know, any ailment, a heart condition, asthma. And it's a hassle to get some treatment. And this is the, one of the easiest ways to draw people. And this is a part of Attica, two doctors, you know, among the other things. I have a terminal disease known as polycystic kidneys. Uh, Dr. Williams, the doctor over here, and Dr. Sternberg, they both refused to treat me. I was urinating blood for 36 days straight, and he refused to do anything for me. So I finally got the lawyers to get me out to the hospital. The hospital has asked the institution to commit me to the hospital where they can do more testing because my right kidney has stopped operating. I'm working only on 7% of my left kidney. And they want to take the right kidney out and they refuse to let me go. It's very obvious when you go up there and see the conditions and talk to these people that it was the conditions that caused it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a situation where uh, the, the people up there, the men up there, had had no real choice because they were dying and uh you know because these demands that they presented uh, you know uh it wasn't uh the past two weeks that they presented it you know they presented these demands uh back in april and then presented them again in july there was some you know uh reform submitted to oswald about maybe let's see july about asking just for menial things like you know more showers better food, uh, uh, lessening of, you know, re uh, restrictions on re reading material, things of this nature. Um, I, I consider it a request. Um, but whatever it was, it was something that I take it you had studied the yes. manifesto and you had looked into the, into the conditions. And is it fair to say that you, you felt that many of the grievances uh, expressed there were reasonable? Yes, I did. And in fact, many of them appeared uh, on the uh, uh, so-called 28 demands which you agreed to. Am That's I right. correct? That's and you right. considered them reasonable, at least when you agreed to them then. Right. There were demands submitted to Rockefeller and Oswald. And they just don't pay it any mind. They just, I guess they throw it in a wastebasket. Was there any attempt made to deal with the basic grievances that they expressed in... Uh, uh, this manifesto, many of which appeared in the 28 demands and which were at that time uh, over the bodies of hostages acknowledged uh, by the commissioner. Well, uh, they were checked out and anything that could be done at the institutional level to uh, many of those were uh, on the commissioner's level or uh, uh, had to do with parole uh, over which they had no well, they had, to do, they had to do with, uh, with uh, parole and, and matters which were uh, either for the legislature or for the correction department, but they also had to do with things such as matters we've discussed, the showers, the soap, uh, as well as uh, diet. Uh, were there any things here that in, in this manifesto that caused any change or response on the institutional level? Yes, uh, there was, uh, pork was not used to the extent that it was before, and the diet is one of the things. Uh, one of the things that brought blacks and whites together in Attica was the uh, memorial for George Jackson, you know, which happened a couple weeks before the rebellion. There was, um, as we've heard this morning, an institution-wide demonstration in August, is that correct? That's correct. And that was the uh, commemoration of the death of George Jackson at San Quentin. What was the reaction among inmates you talked to to the shooting of George Jackson? Well, inmates had always been generally been aware that in the past institution members could get away with killing inmates as evidenced by the bodies found down in one of the southern institutions. But nobody ever really expected it to happen, or at least they didn't stop to think about it as being a real possibility until it happened to Jackson. Um, the fact that there was no official investigation into it, that there was a story given out, 
and that it seemed that the outside world believed it, this made it appear to the inmate at Attica that if they can get away with it there, they can get away with it anywhere. You know, you have people that feel that they're a little better than other people. And uh, that was, uh, you know, no less a factor in Attica. You had guys that worked for the warden that thought they were better than guys that worked in, you know, in the laundry. And guys that worked in the laundry thought they were better than guys that worked in the mess hall. Guys that worked in the mess hall thought they were better than guys that cleaned, you know, mopped and swept the hallway. So it was a thing, you know, it was a class thing. But on this particular day, the George Jackson thing, uh, everybody said, you know, everybody was together. The warden's running was sitting with the, you know, the guy that mopped the hallway. You know, that morning everybody went to mess hall. Nobody had touched anything. Nobody had talked. You know, since they left the gallery, nobody had talked on their way to the mess hall. You know, and uh, the officers who was on duty was frightening. You know, because even you would feel frightened because it was, it was like a church. You know, it was something like you never experienced before. It was silence. You know. And it was something you could hear, the, the, the timepiece on your hand ticking, you know? Did the unity which was demonstrated at Jackson Day create apprehension on your part? Yes, it did. Uh, what brought you to Attica in the first week of September? I wanted to sit down and um, uh, talk with um, some of the people there. I wanted to uh, have an opportunity to get a feel of the institution on the spot. Um, I wanted to talk with uh, uh, some of the signers of this, uh, quote, manifesto, which I never consider such. Commissioner Oswald then left behind the tape, and that was played for the inmates. Many of you have voiced confidence in me and in the directions I have talked about. And I appreciate this. I'm certain you realize that change can't be accomplished overnight. But I can assure you that changes will be made, just as some changes have already taken place in the brief period of eight months. I was in my cell when he played his tape, you know, we was in the cell, and they played the tape like you hear different comments and all this shit, you know, guys are saying, oh, he's bullshit and things like this here, you know. Say, uh, that sucker ain't gonna do nothing. This is, you know, they've been doing this here for years, making like, uh, they're gonna do something, and actually ain't gonna do nothing, you know. An official could get up there and say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this. Better food, uh, no more brutality, better educational system, no more racism, right? No more callousness. And while he's saying this, through the corner of his mouth on the other side, he's saying, put that guy in a box, kill him, torture him, don't let him out, he's voicing his political views, uh, uh, feed them garbage. I mean, it takes something like, you know, uh, 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 a physical action to bring any type of attention to, you know, the conditions that are inside the institution. The next time that Commissioner Oswald spoke to the inmates of Attica, he was in D-Yard on September 9th. So oh, what's more important, the lives of these people or the retaking of this institution? This institution is not important. It's lives that we're interested in there. What's more important? But if we cannot live as people, then we will at least try to die like men. <laughs> I think what happened is definitely the authorities fault. I really do. I feel that they know their prisons and they know very well not, not one of them could survive in them. Even after dealing with the problem and knowing what the problem is and has been exposed, 43 people, there have still been no consideration. All rhetoric, everybody's talking about, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. When are you going to do this? The problem is now. See, ain't nothing changed. Everything is still the same. We still ain't got nothing. People have been telling them for years, they know what's got to be done. They just don't want to do it. They refuse to do anything. And they're going to keep on refusing. And they're going to keep right on having more atticus and more atticus until uh, they finally realize they got to do something. But they slow learners or something. They
Could you tell us whether you've adopted any new programs uh, as a result of this or intensified any old programs uh, designed to, uh, to reduce the uh, possibility of recurrence? Uh, we have instituted two gun posts. All they speak about is security, 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 security. They would need no security if they would give us some help, some concrete help. But the people in the street don't think about this. They paint it. When they cast those votes, that's what they got to think about. Where that money is going, what is it for? What is it doing for the man behind the wall? We are lost. They're hiding us. Actually, conditions are worse because there are officers, you know, like the pigs, right, walk around with M16s and, you know, various weapons, and nothing's going on now. See what I'm saying? There's heavy supervision, uh, there's more security for the administration. So conditions have gotten worse in essence. And they, they set up all types of uh, gun posts in the yard, you know, where the inmates go at, you know, the population yard, you know, it used to be, gun posts used to be on the wall, but now it's in the yard where it's small yards where the inmates be at, you know. So any type of gathering, all the rifles are pointing on you, you know, and uh, they just, Dan, you know, to shoot somebody. Somebody's gonna, you know, trigger off a shot and everybody else gonna follow. It could happen all over again, easily. It has happened uh, right after Attica, Yardville, uh, Rawway. And it's still happening. Certainly, I see more Attica's. Uh, just before I came out, something broke out in, come on, Pete, uh, Baltimore, I believe. Uh, it was a small thing. Some people had escaped from prison, women and men, right? Certainly, I see more Atticus. The white racist, he showed me something with that bloodbath that we had on the 13th in Attica. That woke me up. But that made me look deeper at me. So I took a look at myself. And then I took my head off and put it on the bed and researched it and got myself together and started dealing with my problems, which me of the people. I don't know. My brother, he is strong. You understand? He's not no pushover. He's not gonna let nobody push over him. And knowing that my family and my friends and my loved ones and my brothers and sisters, you know, is so concerned, that made my part of the struggle much, much broader. You know, because I know that if I ever stop, you know, that I'm not gonna be contented with myself because I'll be letting them down. And I came back home and I was so happy, you know, I told everybody, my friends, I said, if we were to go up there and see my brother, you wouldn't believe that he was in prison because he is so strong. And so I asked him, you know, what was he doing up there? He said, uh, right now he's reading. He said, if we was to go in his room, he got so many books in there, he said, you wouldn't even be able to get in. He said, you had to back up to get in his room. He said, if you wanted to know anything, he said, ask him, he would tell you. Anything you want to know. He's very strong. And I believe one day, when he do be free, he gonna really make this world become something. My life is for the people. For the rest of my life. For the oppressive people. People, are gotta, people gotta wake up. See, this is the whole situation. People have been asleep too long. It could be because uh, they're politically unaware of what's going on or they just never paid any attention to it because they have their own problems. But they got to wake up because this is really affecting them too and they don't realize it yet. The only time they realize is when there's an explosion, when something happens. Look what occurred. Look at Dunbar, the assistant commissioner. Real fraud. Biggest fraud there is. You can see right through them. If anybody can't see through them, uh, then they need eyeglasses. And Rockefeller sanctioned all this? He actually sanctioned all this? And Nixon sanctioned Rockefeller? Look who we got as a president. And if people can't wake up behind all these things. Before I had been pretty much of a pacifist and uh, just like getting high all the time and things like that, you know, I found out that if you don't become involved, you're, you know, you're really giving your sanction to whatever order is existing. You know, and if you don't voice some kind of political or social opinion about the way things are, you know, to at least 
you know, try to change them, then you're, you're as bad as the people that are upholding all the, uh, all the establishments. <laughs> the 13th woke me up when I saw those, you know, when I almost got shot twice. And it was a black man that saved my life. And he, he ended up getting shot. And uh, that woke me up. I didn't think that I would survive, like I said. I was shot seven times, and I really thought that it was all over. But somehow I did survive. So for this, I'm grateful, you know. But a lot of, the, a lot of brothers didn't make it. And I think about this. And I think about that those brothers, you know, that didn't make it. They cannot be uh, forgotten. They cannot uh, have died in vain. Their, 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 their deaths must mean something. It must be made known to the people what, what their deaths meant. You see, what the whole struggle was about, people are easy to forget. Because we're living in a world that's fast moving, you know. Things are happening every day. That things that happened yesterday, today become uh, passe, forgotten about. So, I cannot let this die. And I will not let it die in the minds, the hearts, of the people. Because it, 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 it is a part of me. And it is this that I am dedicated to keeping alive, you see in the minds and the hearts of the people so that they can always realize that these things can happen to them. What I see is this for the people in the street. I see, wake up. Stop hiding. Stop talking about it don't exist. Stop talking about you don't understand it. Stop talking about that cold water flat you live in is good enough for you. Stop talking about where you in jail and uh, you getting three meals a day. I'm that wake up because the same thing is happening to me is happening to you. And deal, petition, rallies. Let the people, let the governor, let the president and people that are in a position to do something about this know how you feel about your sons and your daughters that's incarcerated. Other than that, wake up, because nothing comes to a sleeper but a dream.